So let's talk about uh, what you guys did before you have this this uh, travel and chase the sun lifestyle. Did you guys both work uh, nine to five before reaching Phi? Yeah, so we were both computer engineers um, living in one of the most expensive places in Toronto, um, doing what everyone else was doing, which is, you know, get a job, work until you're 65, get a mortgage, that whole adulting path that, you know, all millennials are supposed to follow. Uh, so our, our jobs, his job was actually not bad. My job was pretty stressful. And I think it was because of me watching my coworkers get super stressed out to the point where one of them actually... Um, had major health issues and almost collapsed and died at his desk that I just had this wake up call that I was like, you know what, maybe the path that our parents have written for us all these time, all these years doesn't make sense anymore. Maybe, maybe that was perfect advice for back in 1980s, you know, when interest rates were normal and housing was affordable and jobs were actually stable. So I decided, you know what, I think we need to do something else. Maybe this, these rules don't really make any sense anymore you started to write your own yes exactly, pretty much yeah. yeah so that that's what kind of inspired you not only um you know your situation but also looking at some of your coworkers. i mean working yourself into a health issue is i mean that's that's just so sad to see and i understand it wasn't just that there were also other people in your life that were kind of influencing some of that fire as well i mean people that you worked with is that right oh absolutely the really scary thing is the coworker that almost died at his desk um, he basically had to get surgery, emergency surgery, and then um, he basically took a week off and then came back to work like it was nothing. Yeah, he could that have... that was really scary. He that could... was like, oh my god, what is going when on? When we asked him about that, uh, he said he couldn't afford to stop working even for an instant, and because the mortgage rate, the mortgage payments would like eat him alive, and then he would lose everything. So that's kind of when I realized that um, that people's people really don't know what the heck they're doing with money. There was some statistic that that um, that I read, uh, it was part of this documentary that we're in, uh, they, they said something like 40-50% of Americans are like one paycheck away from financial ruin. And for the longest time, I didn't believe that until this um, earlier this year when there was that federal government shutdown right. uh, that went for like 35 days. And then I'm, I'm watching it with uh, with some, you know, just kind of like, oh, that's interesting. Um, something about a wall. I, di I didn't really follow the politics of it. <laughs> But what was the most interesting to me about that is that the federal workers that were getting laid off, they were at food banks like two weeks into the shutdown because they were just out of food. And I was just kind of like, wow, people are really living paycheck to paycheck. And I and and, and just kind of like that statistic really is true. One missed paycheck, just financial ruin. And what I realized from that was that mortgages is the biggest reason for that to that to happen because it creates this debt uh, for the next 25 years that's tied to your paycheck and you can't ever miss a paycheck or the entire or your entire life falls apart. Yeah. And that's kind of where I started. We started to go, you know what, maybe mm. a house is not the best solution. If you guys saw some of these things and you were inspired, that it was almost like you had PTSD seeing some of your, your coworkers go through <laughs> yes. some of that thing. So your, your PTSD at least led into FIRE, which is good. But so what um, what changes did you guys make sort of immediately in order to in order to go towards fire? Well, we decided that we weren't going to put the money towards a house and we were going to stop going to open houses, which were just a nightmare in of itself because... There were some house, open houses in which as soon as we walked through the door, the real estate agent would look at us and be like, like, you can afford this? Look at how young you are. Like, how much money could you possibly have? You could just tell they did not want to even show you the house. Um, and then on top of that, anytime you try to make an offer, it's, you know, bidding offer, bidding war immediately ensues. So the first thing we did was, OK, let's stop. We're not going to go to any more open houses. We're not going to put the money towards a down payment because it's just going to, you know, we're just going to get into more debt. And then my work is getting more stressful. It doesn't make any sense. So we decided to learn how to invest. So that, that was the first step towards FIRE. How do we make this money generate passive income so that we don't ever have to work again rather than constantly feed a house and prevent us from ever being free and tied to our jobs forever? Because after that moment, after that moment, we uh, at the time we we, kept, we had been saving up uh, money for a while. We are we were really good at saving money because we kept, you know, we kept living frugally um, for the purposes of you the know, house, saving up the house. 
<laughs> uh, like saving up money for the down payment. And the down payment fund had gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger at that point to the point of around 2012, it was worth about half a million dollars. Wow. And, and, and at that point, at that point, we were getting ready to, um, to uh, buy a house or we had been trying to. But even in uh, even then, with that amount of money, it would still result in another half a million dollars of debt because the damn house would have cost a million or more. So at that point, we, we started uh, learning how the math works for fire. And um, with half a million dollars and given how much we were spending just living in Toronto, which was about forty thousand uh, uh, dollars, as per the four percent rule, we needed a million dollars to retire. So uh, running the math through, I realized if we bought a house, we were we it would be you know we'd be paying that debt off for another you know um, five or ten years or we could be retired in three and at that point it was like I think I'd much <laughs> rather do this yep. so so we pulled the trigger and and um, and and I didn't realize this at the time but we had become uh, so when we gave our notice uh, we were still thirty one and when we um, when when we left we later but then realized that we had become like the youngest people in Canada to have retired. And it was all because we just, all because we didn't buy a house. And that became really, really, um, like that went crazy in the media because the idea, because the idea of that home ownership is what adults do and home ownership is the best way to build wealth. If like our experience flew directly in the face of all of that. And it wasn't theoretical. It was just like, no, I didn't buy a house and now I'm a millionaire. And then people kind of went, uh, what? So that, that, that's kind of where the that's kind of where the media stuff and the blog kind of exploded from. Well, let me ask some specifics then, because you said you built that half million dollars in savings. Where were you putting that money when you were building that up? Was that just in a regular savings account? Were you already putting that in like a taxable brokerage, and then you realized the the potential of it? Where, where was that money sitting? Uh, the, the the shorter the, the short answer is it was mostly in a savings account for most of the time. I guess the longer answer is like around 2008 and 2007. Um, I didn't realize I didn't know that we were going to be buying a house, so I started investing somewhat in the stock market using you know crappy mutual funds and like this kind of stuff. Um, uh, right into 2008, uh, so that, that that caused that huge crash. Um, so when I so when I uh, got when we got out of that, uh, we moved all the rest of that money into cash in preparation to um, to buy, to buy a house. Then in 2012, when we decided to do the fire thing, we then shifted the money back towards investing. But this time we did it properly using, you know, an index portfolio um, with ETFs and, and all the kind of stuff that we advocate on the site now. So, so because we were actually putting that money in a savings account and trying to like work towards a house, we actually missed out on three years of the bull market run. And it didn't matter. And we still were able to retire within 10 years, right, as a result of not buying the house, which just goes to show that the goal of like sinking everything into debt really, really hurts you. And even when you make a mistake of not being in the stock market, you can still get out of it and retire early, despite yeah. the mistake that we made. Absolutely. You got you guys jumped in at a, at a good time to, to get back in and take advantage of that growth. So tell me, just to help everybody out, because we all hear index funds, ETFs, can you tell us specifically what you guys did when you made that switch over to uh, investing and saving for FIRE? What what are your what is your philosophy? You guys like index funds? Talk about that a little bit more. T tell everybody what that means. Sure. So when we realized that we were going to go back into investing, we uh, calculated and, and realized we were about three years away from hitting our target. So what happened there was we created a index portfolio that's about sixty percent equity, forty percent fixed income. It's still pretty much the uh, portfolio that we use today. And um, for us in Canada. We then took the equity portion of it and just split it equally between Canada, U.S. and the international indexes. For Americans, you would probably want to go U.S. and the international indexes because there's no reason for Americans to invest in Canada. Um, but uh, and then the rest of it and, and then the rest of it is put into uh, bonds and fixed income instruments just to um, just to reduce the volatility and kind of smooth out the ride. And that's kind of where we uh, did it. That's kind of what we did. It really isn't anything complicated. And I teach people how to do this on our, on our site in this. I ran this whole thing for like a year called the investment workshop where um, I was where I taught people how to like actually build a portfolio from scratch and exactly what to buy and exactly how to build a portfolio and exactly how to like um, rebalance and all this kind of stuff. And it really isn't that hard, but it's not obvious to a lot of people because, you know, we aren't taught any of this kind of stuff in school. 
So one of, one of the things that helped me a lot, because I came from a background where, you know, I grew up in rural China. I didn't actually grow up in Canada. So I always had that scarcity mindset, right, where I, initially I was attracted to housing because the stock, stock market was terrifying to someone who has that background. So the only thing that really got me out of that terrified mindset was the fact that we were investing in index funds. So I realized that with index funds, your portfolio cannot go to zero because you're buying the entire market. You're not betting on individual stocks and you're not you know, being had by some banker who's telling you, well, yeah, you're getting these crazy 20% returns. So being like very pragmatic about it and understanding how indexing works was actually really helpful in getting that mindset away from housing and towards investing.